Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. We're continuing in our series. We've been in for quite a while. On, I'm, entitled, I'm entitling Love and Judgment. And today, if I'm counting right, is part 11. I think we got at least, at least one more part before we end up uh, and close out this series. And today, I want to talk about Yeshua's victorious love. And what I mean by that is the unique kind of power that God uses to display the beauty of his love and the power of his love. That reminds me of this old a song by Huey Lewis in the News called The Power of Love. <laughs> you know, you remember, anybody remember that old song? Uh, don't take money, don't take fame, don't need no credit card to ride this train. <laughs> Just need a little help from the above. That's the power of love. <laughs> well, the Word of God says this about the power of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved... It's the power of God. Note that the present tense that you, that's used here, very interestingly, Paul says, to us who are being saved, is a present participle. In the Greek, it denotes a present, ongoing, continuous action. Of course, we in modern believing world don't usually talk that way, do we? Uh, we say, are you saved? Past tense. But the Bible actually uses all three tenses. Are you saved? Are you in the process of being saved? Will you be saved? Because the biblical concept of salvation is not merely about your eternal destination, but it's also, in fact, primarily about your participation in the ongoing life of God. It's being made whole, having, having the shalom of God, if you will, abiding in you, and in you walking in that moment by moment with God. And so for those who are being saved for those who are being, uh, being made whole, for those who are learning how to participate in, in the reign of God, uh, for those people, Paul says, Messiah and his cross, his cross are the power of God. Now also, Paul says, however, that it's foolishness to everybody else. But, but if you're walking and abiding in the kingdom, you will see that it's the power of God. Drop down to verse 23, 1 Corinthians 1.23. But we preach Messiah crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, to those who are being saved, to those who are participating in the reign of God, both Jews and Greeks, Messiah is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Verse 27, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Notice too that the cross looks weak. The power of God looks weak, but it's the power of God. The cross looks weak and foolish to those who think they're strong. It looks shamefully weak and foolish, but the cross will ultimately put to shame those who think they're strong. Everything that the world thinks is strong and powerful is contradicted uh, by and shamed by the real power of God, as displayed by the self-sacrifice of Yeshua. And that means the central way that you can know that you're thinking and talking about the true power of God, as opposed to these false ideas about God's power, is that it will look weak in the world's eyes. It will look foolish. It'll look shamefully weak. If it looks like that, if it doesn't look, look anything like a uh, power that we normally associate with the world, then it's, it's an indication that it's the real power of God. This is what I'm calling Paul's criterion of foolishness. If your conception of God's power doesn't look shamefully weak and foolish, it's not the true biblical picture of God's power. Because God's power is defined by Calvary. Keep that in mind. I want you to lock that in. That this is the this is, uh, is is as true of God's power, by the way, as it also is of His love. Both God's power and His love are defined by Calvary, by self-sacrifice. 
And if you're really seeing it for what it is, it's going to take a supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit to receive it. Because in our natural, finite, fallen mind, it's foolishness and weakness and folly. That's why Paul prays in Ephesians 3 that we'd have the power to understand and to grasp the love of God. Well, 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 the power of God is simply the power of his love. And it likewise takes a supernatural revelation of God to believe that it's true. If anyone is talking about a conception of God's power that doesn't take a supernatural anointing to believe it, then you can know it's not the true power of God. The true power of God to the natural mind looks foolish and shamefully weak. Uh, it takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit to see it as being the power of God. Now, I want to get into this a little deeper, and I want to take us back to Genesis 3 and the fall. The fall consists of the enemy seducing us to want to be God, uh, uh, to be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, we're supposed to be like God uh, in terms of our character. That's the goal, to have a godly character, uh, to be like God, to be made in his image and in terms of our love. But he doesn't want us to be like him in other ways. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's God's loving, no trespassing sign, if you will. He's saying, you be like me in terms of the love you have for one another and self-sacrificially lay down your life for one another. But don't try to be like me in terms of thinking that you know all the good and all the evil that's within everybody else uh, and that you can judge their hearts. Don't try to be like me uh, in thinking that you can define good and evil. Uh, don't think it's your job to police good and evil uh, and to pass assessments uh, and verdicts and condemnations on everybody else. Don't succumb to that mindset that constantly is evaluating and critiquing and criticizing and assessing and comparing and contrasting and judging others. Let me, God says, take care of the judgment. I'm the only one that can perfectly see men's hearts. Rather, your job is to love others and to ascribe to them unsurpassable worth because that's what I do, and they're made in my image. But the fall results because we were not content. We were not content with this role. Why? Because we want to be God. And so we have this impulse uh, to be omniscient, to, to, to be all-knowing. Uh, we want to be like God in terms of wisdom. So we eat of this forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by giving into the enemy's temptation, the accuser makes us into little accusers. And we start judging ourselves and judging other people and judging God. And we wrongfully make God into an accuser because we project our own accusing impulse onto him. The enemy blinds us to the truth of God and the beauty of God and the love of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, The God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Messiah in the image of God. Satan blinds us. Instead of seeing God as loving uh, and serving and the self-sacrificial God revealed in, in Yeshua, we instead see him as an accuser. The enemy perverts our conception of God's love. And the same thing happens with power. We want to be like God, not only in terms of his wisdom, but also in terms of his power. We grasp after power. We have an impulse for power. Uh, we want to control things. We want to, con we want to be the Lord of our own life. Uh, you know why? Because it's all about power. We want to have our own security at our own hands uh, that we can control. That's all about power. We want to manipulate our environment to get our needs met and to feel good about ourselves and to get others to agree with us. That's about power. This is a fallen impulse. Uh, this desire to control and have power. Uh, our own way of getting life to be Lord of our own life. It's part of the core sin that separates us from God. We have this impulse to control. And when this impulse gets wrapped up with our impulse to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, then we have an, imp 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 an impulse to control and an impulse to be all wise, an impulse to judge and to accuse and to condemn. We like to judge and to accuse and to condemn and to assess and criticize others. Why? Because it makes us feel superior. We feel that we're better and wiser and more moral and holy than the person we're judging. 
at least in terms of the area we're, we're critiquing and criticizing. But that is a perverted mindset. That is a fallen impulse. And when we get, that gets mixed up with our impulse to control, we want to take our superior wisdom and superior morality and impose it on others. Everybody wants to rule the world and be king, one in one way or another. The trouble is there can only be one king. So if I'm right, and, and if you disagree with me, well, then you have to be wrong. If I have superior wisdom and morality, then your morality uh, and wisdom that disagrees with mine must be inferior. And boom, we've got conflict. <laughs> Indeed, most of the hatred and the violence throughout human history is a result of this lethal combination of our lust for wisdom, thinking we know what God says we cannot know about good and evil, and our lust for power. And you put these two together, bam, you've got war. That's why politics is often so ugly, right? Why, for example, can't um, MSNBC News and Fox News get together and kind of do a 1 Corinthians 13 love on one another? <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be amazing to see the Republicans and the Democrats get together and say, you know, I so much appreciate your heart. You care for the poor. You've got some great ideas. Now, I disagree with you about this and about that, but at least your heart's in the right place. Let's get together. Let's get something done. It doesn't work that way, does it? <laughs> you turn on a liberal or a conservative talk show, and there is venom against the other side, right? They demonize each other. They don't care like we do. Uh, they don't get it like we do. They're trying to destroy this country. There's this virulence and this hatred due to this lethal combination of our lust for forbidden wisdom and our lust for power. And just as we project uh, this, our impulse to accuse onto God and make him, him into the cosmic accuser, we, hear me well, we also take our impulse to control and project that onto God and make him into the cosmic controller. And just as our impulse to make God the accuser blinds us to his beauty, so also when we, when we project our fallen impulse to control onto God, likewise, it blinds us to his beauty. And instead of seeing the beauty of God's love, we end, we end up defining his greatness in terms of sheer power. Uh, and by power, I mean control. We'd want to control the world if we could. So we assume that God must be like us. He must be this micro-controlling God who wants to control every detail of the world just because he can. In fact, however, this is the oldest piece of pagan theology that exists, that there is. You go back as far as you can in history, as far as you want, study what the pagans believed about God, and you're going to find this. God's greatness is his power. If it wasn't about his character, it wasn't about his goodness, it was about his power. We've always worshipped power. Why is Zeus the greatest of all the gods? Hint, it's not because he has such a great character. <laughs> it's not because of his morality or his holiness or his love or his goodness. Read Homer. Zeus is a petty, jealous, vengeful, prideful, lusting, deceiving, conniving, angry, violent, autocratic despot. He's as fallible and as sinful as any fallen human. But he's got more power than anybody else. Just look at those lightning bolts. <laughs> and that's what makes him impressive to us, his power. Because that's what we want. Zeus is great only because of his power. And you go back even farther, before the Greeks, you go back to the ancient Mesopotamians, or the Sumerians, or the Babylonians, you'll find their greatest god is always the one with the most authority and control. And the gods are always scheming against and fighting with each other to get the control. Defining God's greatness in terms of his power and control is purely pagan. And then people come along and say, our god isn't just the most powerful of the gods, he's all-powerful meaning he's all-controlling, meaning he's micro-controlling. Nothing happens in the entire universe that he doesn't minutely control. He's the big master blueprint uh, of the universe that he controls, it like, one, like, like a big blueprint. Everything that happens is his doing. This is like Zeus on steroids. <laughs> 
And so you have the ancient Stoics in the 4th century BC who say that everything that happens is the result of God's will. This is also the kind of power that's ascribed to Allah in the Quran. In Islam, everything that happens, for good or for ill, they say is part of God's will, part of Allah's will. And then beginning with St. Augustine in the 4th century, who was a student, by the way, of Greek philosophy, this view begins to creep into Christianity. Everything that happens, good or bad, is a result of God's all-controlling will. Even though Yeshua tells us, pray that God's will, 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 will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, we're to pray for this to come about. Why? Because God's will is often not done on earth. That's why we pray that it will be one day. Uh, uh, we live in a fallen world. Intelligent beings are given free will, men, angels, demons, and they exercise their wills, which often is contrary to and often thwarts God's will. That's why bad things happen. Now, this idea of God controlling everything that ever happens, good or bad, it's as old as paganism itself. And it completely blocks our capacity uh, to be overwhelmed by the beauty of God's love. And, and, and uh, some of the implications are very troubling. Because if God is, in fact, controlling everything, then all of the ugliness and all of the evil in the world is laid at his doorstep. And our picture of God gets very distorted. If God's controlling everything, for example, that means that the dozen or so young people who got mowed down at the Colorado theater showing a Batman about a month ago, well, God was controlling that. And the little girl who was sexually abused and then tortured to death by her mother's sick boyfriend, well, every detail of that, every rape, every knife slash, every scream, Every bloody gash, every nightmarish experience of fear and pain and horror was exactly what God controlled. So says this theology. And every cancer, and every paralysis, and every, every tsunami and tumor, uh, and, and every volcano and earthquake killing millions every year, it all happens exactly as God wills it and wants it and controls it because he's controlling everything. Every molecule, molecule in this universe says this theology. And our wars uh, and holocausts and Hitlers and Stalins and Maos of, of history uh, and the massacres and the genocides and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia uh, and the racial slaughter in Rwanda, it's all exactly as God wants it as he does all the controlling. I submit to you that this theology pollutes our picture of God. It blocks us from seeing his beauty. And it's so natural for us to project unto God our own controlling mechanism. And so we say, when tragedy happens, it's all part of God's plan. Now, God can use tragedy uh, to bring good out of evil. Uh, and what you or others intend for evil, God can use for good. But that doesn't mean that he plans the evil or causes it or controls it. Because we live in a fallen world populated by fallen people and fallen angels, all of whom God has given free wills to make their own choices. And choices have consequences. But some Christian theologies, influenced more by Greek philosophy than by biblical revelation, view God as micro-controlling all pieces of the universe as if the little girl got raped right when he wanted her to, and the kidnapping occurred just as it was supposed to, and the policeman was shot and killed just as it was planned and predestined and foreordained. These theologies cannot allow one maverick molecule and say that God God's controlling all of this. And they also say that God is a God of love. But it's hard to see how that's possible if he's controlling all the hatred, if that's his doing. And they say this God is controlling everything is altogether beautiful. But it's hard to see how that's possible if he's the one controlling all the ugliness. And they say this all controlling God is a caring God. But it's hard to see how that's possible if every kidnapping and rape and murder is his doing, since he's allegedly controlling everything. Now, people, people may fear this kind of God, or be grateful he didn't predestine them to hell. In the same way I mentioned last week that I was grateful to my dad that he took the punishment out of my sister and not on me. <laughs> But it's really hard in the core of your being to have this passionate love and joy and delight in this type of micro-controlling God. 
Because for all you know, perhaps it's your newborn baby girl who's predestined to go to hell and there's nothing you or she can do about it. And then we're told by these same theologians, this is all for God's glory. So we project onto God our own fallen impulse to control and to exercise power over others. But how different this is from the Bible's understanding of divine power. And how different this is from the Bible's portrait of God and understanding of God. Now you can find verses, yes, that can be interpreted to support the all-controlling picture of God. But you also find a ton of verses that reject that view. And the verses in support of it can be interpreted in, in many other ways. But much more important than how you interpret this verse or that verse is this. What kind of picture of God do you have in Yeshua? Because the scriptures say that he is the singular word of God. The singular image of God. The singular form of God. That all the fullness of the deity dwells in him. Yeshua says in John 14, 7, you, If you know me, you know my Father. And in John 14, 9, If you see me, you have seen the Father. John 10, 38, The Father is in me. I'm in the Father. For John 10, 30, For I and the Father are one. Echad. Hebrews 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets uh, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Yeshua is the final and supreme and complete and perfect revelation of God. Yeshua trumps all other revelations of who God is. And so Hebrews 1.3 says this, He's the radiance of God's glory. He's Shekinah. He's the exact representation or image of his being, of his essence, hypostasis. If you want to know who God is, he looks like Yeshua. So what kind of picture of God do we find in Yeshua? It's not the microcontrolling picture of God. It's not the God who uses his power in that way. It's a very different kind of God and a very different kind of power uh, uh, that, 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 we're, that we're given in the person of Yeshua. Indeed, Yeshua says this in Matthew 20, 28. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. Now, let me be very clear here. I believe with all my heart that God is all-powerful and all-sovereign. Yes, amen. But we mustn't take our fallen, worldly, fleshly, carnal ideas of power and of sovereignty and impose them on God. Rather, we must let God tell us what his divine power looks like when he has it. And we, I mean, we must let God tell us what his sovereignty looks like when he exercises it. And he tells us what it looks like in the person of Messiah Yeshua, who is Hebrews 1.3 says the exact representation, the perfect expression of God's essence. Which brings me back to Paul's criterion of foolishness. If a conception of God's power doesn't look shamefully weak and foolish, it's not a true biblical conception of God's power. If a conception of God's power looks like normal worldly power, you're not talking about the right kind of power. If it doesn't look weak and foolish, it's not a conception of God's power as revealed in Yeshua. But here's the thing. Holy Spirit, help us to see this. There's nothing weak about the world's all-controlling portrait of God. There's nothing foolish about the all-controlling portrait of God. There's nothing unnatural about this all-controlling pic picture of God. It's totally normal. That's exactly what we would do if we were running this universe. And the proof is, go back as far as you want in paganism, and that's always how they thought about God. That's the normal, worldly way to think about God. There's nothing distinctively scriptural about that. It's as pagan as it gets. We project under God our own fallen use of power, and we assume that that's how God uses power. It doesn't take a supernatural act of God to believe that God exercises total control of that kind of power, because that's what the pagans have always believed. But it does take a supernatural revelation of God to believe that God uses power in the way of Calvary, in the way of the cross, in the way of sacrifice, 
and self-denial, the way of Yeshua. The reason why we want to control is because we're fallen, because we're empty. We want to control because we then feel secure and, and less vulnerable. We want to control because then we get our needs met in our way. We want to control because we want to ascribe worth to ourself. We want to control because we're pathetic. <laughs> it's true. You show me a control freak, and I'll show you someone who's pathetic on the inside. Now, we're all pathetic in various ways. We manipulate to get our own needs met. But imagine now a God who's not pathetic. Imagine a God who's not empty or needy. Uh, imagine a God who doesn't need power to acquire every, anything because he's already full. Imagine a God who has no emptiness, who has no insecurities, who's perfectly self-confident. And I'll ask this question. How would that kind of God use all of his power? Imagine a God whose perfect, eternal, agape love. A God who's completely other-oriented. A God who's self-sacrificial. A God who delights in pouring himself out for others. And he's been doing this throughout all eternity within the triune Godhead. How would a God like that use his omnipotence? You don't have to guess, because we have a revelation of that in the Brit Hadashah, in the New Covenant Scriptures. Yeshua is that picture of God. And a beautiful example of this is the night he was betrayed. Yohanan, in John 13, verse 2, it says this. The evening meal was in progress, the Pesach Seder, and the devil had already prompted Yehuda, Judas, the son of Shimon Iscariot, to betray Yeshua. Yeshua knew the Father had put everything, all things under his power. He knew this, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, meaning because of this, for this very reason, he gets up from the meal, he takes off his outer clothes, and he wraps a towel around his waist, which, by the way, is a beautiful picture of the Incarnation, a picture of him stripping himself of his glory, of his heavenly home, and wrapping himself in humanity, in the Incarnation. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them, uh, uh, I'm sorry, where are they? Yes, and drying them uh, with a towel that he had wrapped around himself. Precisely because he had all the power, uh, he knew he was God from God, entering into this world to reveal who God was, knowing that, knowing that he was going back to God, knowing that he had all the power, knowing that he could do anything he wanted to in the whole world, what does God do when he can do anything that he wants? Because he is God and he can do anything that he wants. So what does he do? What does Yeshua do? What he does is he wraps a towel around his waist and he gets on his knees and he washes the feet of his disciples. The very ones, by the way, that he knows within a few hours are going to betray him, and deny him, and abandon him. See, this is so radically different from the normal conception of power. Zeus-type gods, they use their power to meet their own needs. They use power to have people serve them. Zeus-type gods have humans washing their feet. They don't wash anybody's feet. No, they've got the power. They use their power to get us to serve them. They don't serve anyone. How different is the true God revealed in Yeshua? It's mind-boggling. He knows he's got all this power, all the power of the universe, and now he's going to manifest what this power looks like by using it to wash the disciples' feet, seizing this wonderful opportunity to wash the dirty, smelly feet of the very people that very shortly, within a few hours, are going to betray and deny and abandon him. It's mind-boggling. The God of the universe, who created the whole universe, who spoke into being, who sustains all things by his word, holds every molecule in existence right now. This awesome God, with his awesome power, he now uses this power, this power that spoke everything into existence and holds us in existence at this very second. He uses that power to do the work of a slave. The most demeaning work of the lowest household servant was to wash the feet of visitors. 
the omnipotent, all-powerful, sovereign God of the universe does that to these disciples right here. You see, that is foolish. That looks weak. We would never do that if we were king of the universe. Which is how you know it's a true conception of God's power. It takes uh, the work of God in your life to believe that this is true. And it gets even crazier than this. A couple of hours after this all-powerful God uh, uh, does this, he now goes into a garden to pray. And he's considering the prospect uh, of the hell that he's going to enter into and the sin that's going to be placed upon him and the separation from the Father. And as a fully human being, the intensity of this causes his blood vessels to burst and blood to ooze out of his pores. That's how the all-loving God uses his omnipotent power. Then folks come to arrest him. And Peter, who's still relying on the world's kind of power, takes out a sword, lops off the ear of one of the aggressors, servant of the high priest. But Yeshua rebukes Peter for using that kind of power. And he says, that's not the kind of power we're into in the kingdom. And then he displays the real kind of power by loving the very guy who's arresting him and healing his ear. That's what the omnipotent God does when he's the God of agape love, an other-oriented God. He uses his power to serve others. He's other-oriented. That's who God is from eternity to eternity. Uh, and then they arrest him, and they mock him, and they beat him, and they spit on him, and they humiliate him, and they crucify him. And they put a crown of thorns on him, yeah. and they pierce his side. That's what the agape, God, agape love God does with his power. He could have stopped it. He could have had legions of angels with just a flex of his muscles come to his, his aid. And then it would have been done. But he lets it happen. Why? Because he's an other-oriented God. And this is what we as fallen humanity needed to save us. And he loves us that much. And then with his final suffocating breath, because, you know, you suffocate when you're crucified. With his very last breath, he prays this in, in Luke 23, 34. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the beauty of this is just beyond comprehension. And, he, and, and, and as he's praying this, they're down there dividing up his clothes by lot, by casting lots. That's how the all-powerful God of agape love uses his power. The soldiers, they're rolling dice as Yeshua, as his naked, pain racked body is hanging on the cross. Because, you know, you were crucified naked. It was part of the humiliation. And he's, he's in this excruciating pain and agony. The all-powerful Messiah who can do anything, this is what he wants to do. He prays for their forgiveness. In this dire situation, this all-powerful God has one thing on his mind. One thing. In his pain-wracked, humiliating situation, the one thing on his mind is about you and about me and about them. Their salvation, their forgiveness, their reconciliation. That's what the all-powerful God does when he's a God of other-oriented love. He uses his power to serve others in the most humble, servant kind of way. Have you ever heard of anything so foolish in your life? Can you imagine a more pathetic picture of God than this, speaking in the natural? We would never do that. If we had all the power in the, use, in the world, would we use it to get ourselves humiliated uh, and crucified for the sake of our enemies? No, we would never do that. We don't even like to be inconvenienced, do we? <laughs> you know, if a military general acted like that, we would fire him on the spot. We tell, him, we tell him, you're supposed to kill your enemies, not love them. See, this is the opposite of the world's way of thinking about power. You know, we've got an election coming up, right? So, so they tell me. So imagine this. Imagine the can candidate running for president. And he announces his policy for how he's going to confront Iran and their threat to develop nuclear weapons. What would happen... If a candidate running for president said this, if elected, I pledge to use my power of the presidency to get victory over Iran, and here's my plan. As the most powerful leader on the planet, 
I'm going to use my power, first of all, to wash the feet of the Iranian president, Ahmadinejad. That's my plan. And then I'll let the Iranians arrest me. And then with all the cameras in full view, to mock me and spit on me and finally nail me to a cross. That's my plan. I'm going to let them do that because I want the Iranians to know that I love them and I care about them. And then I'm going to bring out the real shock and awe. Because as I'm hanging naked on this cross, I will publicly pray for God to forgive them. As they're gambling over my clothes, I'll be praying for the Lord to forgive them. Would anyone in America vote for such a candidate? Would he carry a single state? Of course not. Because by the world's understanding of power, this is lunacy. This is crazy. You can't run the world this way. This is pathetic. This is weak. They'll win. But let's go back and remember Paul's criterion of foolishness. You know this is the true power of God because the cross is not how we would use power. No military general or president would use power in this way. There's nothing normal about using your power to get crucified for the sake of your enemies, for the sake of saving the very people who are crucifying you. It looks the opposite of, of the normal use of power. It looks the opposite of the Zeus type of power. It looks the opposite of the, of the Allah type of power. It looks the opposite of the Stoic type of power. No God in history has ever been this foolish. To come down and become a vulnerable human being and get crucified by the very people, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, and, and get crucified for and behalf of the very people who are crucifying you. It's foolish, it's pathetic, it's weak. And therefore, it's true. No human being would ever come up with this. We know what human beings do when they want to come up with stuff. And it looks like Zeus. This doesn't look like Zeus. This is a revelation of the true God. It's, the, it's, it's utterly outside of the radar of our normal thinking about power and about love. This is the foolishness of the true God revealed in Yeshua. Because this is the essence of other-oriented power. This is an other-oriented, agape love type of God. So, of course, he'll use his omnipotent, sovereign power in an other-oriented way to serve others. That's who he is. Uh, and that love looks profoundly weak in terms of the world. It looks foolish. But that's because we're in bondage to Satan. Verse John 5, 19, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We're blinded. The same way uh, that, that uh, uh, we're wrong, we wrongfully think that somehow the God is the cosmic accuser. In the same way, we also wrongfully think that he's the cosmic all-controller. Because we're blinded by the God of this world. And because of the fall, we're addicted, uh, addicted to this kind of power to preserve ourselves, defend ourselves, uh, to conquer those uh, who threaten us or oppose us. So we think the cross kind of power is weak, but in fact, it's the power of God. In fact, it's the most powerful force in the universe. As C.S. Lewis, Lewis said, it's the deeper magic built in before the into the world before the beginning of time. Now, yes, brute force can create a universe, and God has that. He can speak into existence every atom, every molecule that, that, that there is. I got that. Billions and billions of stars. Yes, it's an incredible display of raw power. God and God alone has that kind of brute force and sovereign authority. It's amazing. But brute force cannot turn the heart of a personal free being and get them to freely love you. Brute force could make them say loving words, maybe even force their brain to trigger certain neurons to produce a loving thought, but it could never actually get them to fall in love with you. Brute force could never turn the heart of a free moral agent and get them to surrender their life to you freely. Only the beauty of this kind of self-sacrificial power can cause a sinner like me to freely surrender my heart to him. Only the beauty of this other oriented kind of power can transform an enemy into a friend. 
That's why it's the kind of power that we ourselves are called to use. Only this servant kind of love can win us and free us from our addiction uh, to worldly power and from our impulse to accuse and to judge and to take offense and to hold grudges and free us to start dancing with Yeshua in his kingdom. The power to create the universe is impressive, but it's nothing compared to the power to win over people by displaying your self-sacrificial love for them. The most powerful force in the universe is self-sacrificial love. This is how God gets victory. It's the victory of God's love overcoming our rebellion and overcoming our evil and our, our resistance to him. It's the victory of Yeshua, our bridegroom God, winning back our heart, the wayward heart of a beloved who's become unfaithful. This is the victory of the good shepherd who finally finds his lost sheep and the woman who finally finds her lost coin and the father who finally gets his son back. This is the victory. But it's not a victory of, of micro-controlling things. No, it's the victory of love. Uh, the only an insecure deity who didn't trust in the power of his love would have to micro-control things to get victory. And that's not a very praiseworthy kind of victory. But Yeshua displays the kind of victory that leaves the 99 and goes after the one lost sheep and gives everything up for his beloved, for his bride. And finally, notice that the beauty of God's victory is the victory of love. God isn't victorious because it's the victory of love. Notice this, that God is not victorious unless you are part of the equation. Because his victory is getting you back. He's glorified when he shares his glory with you. His victory is when you are brought into the dance of the triune God. God is this beautiful. We'd never do this in our own fallen instincts, if we had all the power in the universe. But Yeshua does. He does this. He actually makes his victory contingent on our joining it. Because he's a God of choice-based, other-oriented, self-sacrificial love. It's foolishness to the world. But that's how you know that it's true. The victory of the crucified God, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Let's stand. Let the music team come on up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. And I'll ask the music team to, to play in the background as we're praying. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your powerful love, but displayed not in the world's way of power. Thank you that your power is displayed in what seems like foolishness and like weakness to the world. But it's the power of God displayed in Yeshua. The power of Calvary. The power of the cross. The power of self-sacrificial love. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you sent your only begotten Son, Yeshua. Thank you for displaying your type of divine power through him the power of forgiveness, the power of self-sacrifice, the power of putting others first, the power of not being served, but of serving others, the power of love, covenant-making, covenant-keeping, faithful, awesome, passionate, burning, ecstatic, all-giving, wholly devoted, fully committed, agape love. Help us, Lord, to love you and to serve you and to follow you and to worship you with that kind of love. We ask that the divine agape love now overflow within us and outward towards others and for us to serve and to love and to sacrifice for our neighbor and for our fellow brother and sister uh, uh, and, for our, and even for our enemy uh, and, and for everyone in this kind of love, to put them first, even above ourselves. Help us not to be served, but to serve, even as Yeshua did, to lay his life, to lay our lives down as a ransom. He, did, he laid his life down as a ransom. Let us, Lord, lay our lives down, Lord, to serve one another. Because Yeshua came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Lord, help me today to wash one another's feet, to wash my neighbor's feet, 
Help me to take the lowest place of every servant. Thank you, Yeshua, that your ways aren't the world's ways. Thank you that, that in your upside down kind of kingdom, the last are first and the first shall be last. And the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. We commit this day, Lord, to serve you with all of our hearts, with all of our hearts, and to show this type of love to others by serving them. Help us, Lord, to be your faithful bondservant, redeemed and transformed by your love. We pray this B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z dash C-H-A-I-M dot org. Or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.